Mr. Sakyandi Subhat. Mr. Speaker, I declare that I work in a financial institution in Singapore. Mr. Speaker, sir, as Prime Minister Lee has flagged in his recent National Day message and National Day rally speech, the high and rising inflation and cost of living is at the top of everyone's minds today. But besides rising prices, rising interest rates will impact Singaporeans and their cash and payment outlays. Our domestic interest rates are likely to increase further in tandem with global interest rates as rates here are largely market determined. For example, US policy rates have been raised to fight inflation by a total of 3% in less than six months, as compared to an almost 0% interest rate for the large part of 2009 to 2021. US Fed officials have indicated that interest rates may continue to rise and hit close to 4.6% in 2023. Some market participants are even forecasting it to reach 5%. In fact, there are no stated upper limits to what the Fed can hike rates to to achieve the inflation mandate. Recent market volatility has also led to higher costs of funds and interest rates, and we are not immune to these sharp moves. Like me, many members of the House have raised parliamentary questions, PQs, or otherwise spoken about these issues in the last few months both on rising prices and on rising interest rates. This motion today is spe specifically on rising interest rates and what it means for Singapore and how we can help Singaporeans in this environment. In line with the government's approach in recent times, I believe there is room for targeted interventions. For this motion, I want to focus on helping Singaporeans transition from a low interest rate environment to a high interest rate environment. The world is unlikely to return anytime soon to the low inflation levels and interest rates it has enjoyed in recent decades. Singaporeans and Singaporean households will need to adjust to the new normal and plan their borrowings and expenditures accordingly. I note that MES and MND have just announced that they will be, there will be revisions to the medium-term rate flaws to ensure that households borrow prudently for their property purchases in a higher interest rate environment from last month onwards. I'm also heartened by the recent Department of Statistics data and expert assessments that households will be able to weather high interest rates and a potential economic recession, given their financial positions as at, as at the second quarter of 2022, as their household assets to liabilities ratio remains healthy. Nonetheless, if interest rates rise significantly higher, one might wonder whether the expected assumptions behind these assessments will remain valid. However, in the short term, we can help and we should help Singaporeans make the transition to this new normal or new abnormal of high interest rates. Many Singaporean families have existing borrowings to finance big ticket items like the mortgages, cars and education, and many of them have carefully budgeted, saved and invested to achieve their financial objective, although based on the old normal. I understand that the government in the midst, is in the midst of formulating measures to help Singaporeans cope with the upcoming economic headwinds and would like to provide some suggestions for consideration. My first suggestion, more can be done in filling the information gap on high interest rates. I'm sure that many Singaporeans like me have received notices from their banks that their loan rates are going up. The notices are quite brief, stating not much more beyond their new rate percentage. That may not be helpful to less financially savvy Singaporeans who might not realise how they might be impacted by the increase including how much more income or savings they would need to service the loan subsequently. I have had residents emails physically to meet me to share with me their financial issues with servicing loans, where I realised they did not understand that their payments pay off the interest first and their principal later. They thought that the lender had cheated them. In this sort of backdrop, we must ensure that the banks and other institutions that provide loans of all kinds including the non-bank financial institutions and authorised money lenders, and so on, proactively clarify the impact to the borrowers. While there are various mortgage loan calculators offered by some banks and other websites on the internet, not everyone may know of them or how to use them. One simple solution would be to shift this task to the banks, financial and other lending institutions who are sophisticated enough to model the practical effects relatively easily. 
While there may be certain uncertainties that may affect the precise impact of an interest rate rise on a particular borrower, the financial institutions can provide an indicative range to give the borrower an idea. This boils down to the basic principle of balancing caveat emptor for the investor customer versus whether the banks owe a social duty of care to more than just the average bank customer. Some of the less sophisticated retail investors and retail bank customers might not have the same level of savviness as the average median investor. This should not be unfamiliar to the financial sector. Insurance agents are already required to provide the benefits illustration in an endowment policy proposal based on the different scenarios of investment rates of return. Financial institutions offering credit cards or mortgages are required by the MAS to provide projections of installments and installment payments under different scenarios. They are all similarly aimed at giving the end consumer an easy to understand picture of the financial calculations. This will also mean that the financial institutions may be able to preempt when home buyers might encounter issues servicing higher home loans if their incomes and savings rates have become insufficient. In such cases, I hope the government or relevant agencies work with the financial institutions to allow for longer term mortgage tenures to accommodate home buyers who struggle to pay higher installments or at the very least be more alert now about such cases and offer some flexibility in current, env uh, current environment as a baseline. My second suggestion, we should enhance the flexibility of some of our policies in order to support the more leveraged and vulnerable households that may require help amidst higher borrowing costs. Our local banks have raised home loan rates from 1.15% per annum as recently as late 2021 to around 3.85% just earlier today, surpassing the 2.6% applicable to HDB loans. The fixed interest rate on HDB loans was certainly less attractive just months ago when bank loan rates were as low as 1.15% to 1.5%. HDB statistics show that 6,800 households applied to refinance their HDB loans with bank loans in fiscal year 2020 to 2021. With the present global interest, rates, interest rate hikes set to continue, they will now be locked in a higher rate than the HDB rate, which they were trying to find a lower alternative for. While I understand that the policy is that homeowners who opt for, for, re, opt for or refinance using bank loans can no longer take up HDB loans, perhaps the HDB can consider allowing eligible households to make a one-time one -time transfer back to HDB loans. While I'm mindful that it may have some back-end implications for the banks, a refinancing sort of mechanism, if one is eligible, could be one possible approach. The HDB loan rate is pegged at 0.1% above the prevailing CPF ordinary account OA interest rate. And HDB and CPF have recently confirmed that the applicable rates will remain unchanged until the end of this year. I understand that the standing policy is for OA interest rate to be reviewed every three months. Given the impact of changes in rates on borrowers' finances in the medium term, it would be helpful if the government or HDB is able to provide HDB borrowers more advanced guidance on potential rate changes beyond three months. This will, all, this will allow new and existing homeowners to make more certain choice on how they finance their home to better prepare them amidst this new normal of interest rate levels that we may be entering. On balance, the information provided will help household decisions but the impact of the extent in which this becomes a de facto forward guidance on rates will need to be considered in totality. We must also ensure that Singapore is prepared in the extraordinary event where home loan rates rise sharply, such as if the US Fed Reserve raises their rates to above 5%. US mortgage rates have already hit 6% for the first time since, 2018, uh, since 2008. Sorry. So does the government have any contingency plans in place? Will MES consider implementing temporary measures such as rate ceilings to ensure that rates do not spiral out of control and become unaffordable? For example, there are already maximum annual percentage interest rates on credit card and pawn loans. Many countries around the world, including our neighbours, Indonesia and Malaysia, have forms of subsidised housing loans targeted at lower income citizens. And this is also an interim policy measure that is worth considering for vulnerable groups not captured by the concessionary HDB loan. Besides housing, education is another key reason for Singaporeans borrowing. There has always been a strong policy reason to ensure that our students who are trying to secure a good education are not saddled with heavy debt before they enter the workforce. 
For example, the MOE study loan allows low-income households to obtain loans that are interest-free for a limited or entire duration of the loan. The CPF education loan scheme allows for the use of one's CPF OA savings to pay for one's own children's or spouse's tuition fees for full-time diploma or degree courses at approved educational institutions. As commercial interest rates increase and study loans become less affordable, perhaps we could enhance these existing schemes by raising the $2,700 gross monthly per capita income cap for MOE study loan and extend the CPF education loan scheme to cover more courses, including part-time accredited diploma or degree courses. This will benefit a greater pool of Singaporeans who are in pursuit of better education, better skills, and who will ultimately be an asset in our workforce. Academic studies using US data have shown that an upskilled workforce has positive externalities to a sector beyond the individual gains. My third suggestion, we should not stop at assistance for individuals. Our SMEs and firms, especially those that operate in sectors that are highly reliant on external financing, will require targeted help as well. As our economy plays catch up from the time lost during the pandemic, there might be a need to take a targeted sector-specific sector approach in limiting the adverse effects that might be brought about by high interest rates that we cannot avoid. To prevent a hard landing from steep hikes in the cost of capital, our SMEs will need some support in transitioning to have enough reaction time to adjust their plans for cash flow, servicing existing debt, and taking on new debt. There might not, but there might also be a need to take a targeted sector-specific approach, construction, and manufacturing are sectors that are known to be sensitive to interest rate hikes as they are capital intensive and dependent on commercial loans. Our focus on construction firms as their cash flows are also tighter due to the longer term nature of construction projects, which have not been helped by the labour and cost disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The construction sector is critical to renewing Singapore's physical infrastructure, which, which itself is a key driver of our con economic competitiveness. MND had announced in May 2022 that 58 BTO projects were delayed by at least six months this year. This has already contributed to a tight housing supply situation and left many households in limbo waiting for their new houses to be completed. So any uncertainty in interest rates could throw the sector into disarray against within this post-pandemic period. So it is important for the sector to be able to continue to access affordable loans. It may not be commercially viable to expect commercial banks to cap or limit the interest rates charged to construction firms, especially when they have to price in the fact that the construction sector has always been trending towards a higher risk of defaulting on repayments. But aside from arguments about consolidation as a form of creative destruction in this sector, and some of the firms may have limited long-term viability anyway, the government may need to step in to provide reliable and affordable sources of temporary financing to eligible SMEs and firms, temporary financing. So I'm thinking of schemes such as the Temporary Bridging Loan Program, the TBLP, that was rolled out during the pandemic, as well as the Temporary Electricity Contracting Support Scheme, TREX, which offer firms the ability to lock in a favourable interest rate or electricity tariff at times where such rates are extremely volatile. The multiple extensions of TBLP, a support measure implemented to help firms with their financing needs during the pandemic, show that it is effective in meeting its purpose. So I hope that the government can consider a further extension past the current end date of the scheme on 30th of September 2022, or a replacement that is also focused on providing eligible SMEs with affordable interest rates. For the sake of fiscal prudence, I do not mean that we should commit to subsidising firms for a prolonged duration. What I have in mind is simply a temporary measure to help our vulnerable firms and SMEs deal with interest rates that have doubled and may, may perhaps triple in just over a period of months. So I urge the government to provide updates as soon as possible on the duration of any support measures to help our firms with their forward planning. Even as we try to enhance our long-term economic growth in this environment, we are fighting business decisions to reduce investments made amidst high hurdle rates for projects and investments. So in, a, in addition, can the government provide and work further with financial institutions to keep the processing fees of these government-assisted loans as low as possible? To add, we should make sure that the measures apply across both bank and non-bank financial institutions or lenders. The latter might rise in prominence in the lending sector if the rise in interest rates make it harder for those with relatively lower credit worthiness or urgent credit needs to access bank loans. Several of them already target SMEs primarily. My fourth and final suggestion on this front, 
As we transition into a new high interest rate environment, our metrics, our metrics for measuring systemic risks may need to be adjusted as well. Our efforts to measure this improperly or with a decent lag can lead to social implications. There have been numerous mentions of the total debt servicing ratio of TDSR in this House in response to members' concerns over the interest rate and debt situation in Singapore in the last few months. The TDSR framework captures a borrower's monthly expenses on all types of debt, including mortgages, car loans and unsecured debt as a proportion of income. Essentially, the MAS sets a ceiling that only 50%, 55% of a borrower's income should be spent on servicing debt obligations. By lowering the ceiling, the MAS can tighten the threshold up to which a person may borrow. But the interest rate that is used to calculate loan repayments under TDSR is the higher of 3.5% or the prevailing market rate. The idea was to build in a buffer against interest rate rises for borrowers who have taken out a mortgage in the past. However, with, the, with today's bank interest rates hitting more than 3% and the US Fed's expectation that its benchmark rate may hit close to 4.4% as soon as this year, and possibly some more next year, the buffer that is built into MAS's monitoring framework may soon be completely eroded. The MAS has just raised interest rates to calculate loan repayments under the TDSR by 0.5%. However, is this move sufficient? to maintain the robustness of MAS's monitoring and stress testing. Given the rate of global interest rate increases and their potential lending points at up to 5%, is the MAS prepared to raise this again, potentially in a matter of a few months? So what is the impact of the current 0.5% adjustment on the TDSR data, and what would be the projected impact of further increases be considering the median TDSR of 43%? I ask these questions because, in part, housing loans are a long tenure with significant overhang and fault risk exposures if the interest rates go up. And in an alternative worst-case scenario, if there's a wave of defaults, repossessions, there's always the risk of market instability with cascading social implications. These interventions I've suggested, Mr. Speaker, above will require the government's use of its revenues. I would like to ask the government whether the government has done an in-depth study on how both interest rate expense and investment incomes will be affected by the higher global rates and recent market turbulence. On the borrowing side, the government will have to incur higher borrowing rates in taking actions to manage banking system like liquidity or even for infrastructure needs. At the same time, on the investment side, DPM Lawrence Wong has also shared in this chamber that over the medium term, rising interest rates will also help to raise investment income from our foreign asset holdings. So has the government also taken into consideration that the rising global interest rate environment and risks of potential U.S. recession that may occur downstream could cause increased volatility for our investments in foreign asset holdings? Global stocks and even cryptocurrencies have already taken a hit with the latest Fed announcements on the need for more interest rate hikes. Questions that probably need to be considered are, first, what are the downside risks in the event of sell-offs in these holdings and what will be the impact on our fiscal position? How many... Uh, and how we may, uh, we, may we also maximise the investment opportunities for, opposed by a high interest rate environment? So I hope the Minister or relevant agencies can shed some light on these questions as it has ramifications on our fiscal trajectory and outlook. Mr Speaker, sir, it appears that a high interest rate environment is here to stay. I hope the government will take into consideration my suggestions above in positive light to mitigate the risk of higher interest rates on Singapore households. We will need to take considered actions to put Singaporeans and our firms in good state to adapt and thrive in this situation. While the government balances the fine line between keeping prices from rising further and dampening economic expansion in the post-COVID recovery period. Mr. Speaker, sir, I beg to move. Mr. Speaker, I thank Mr. Satyandi Supat for his adjournment motion. Our government agencies will look into his points and his suggestions, and I will respond to some of the key points that he raised. As Mr. Satyandi observed, many central banks have been raising interest rates to tackle inflation. Similarly, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, MAS, has taken steps to tighten monetary policy 
and is closely monitoring developments on this front. It is also alert to systemic risk to our financial system arising from higher interest rates. The government will provide assistance to cushion the impact on households and businesses. It is also important for all of us to take steps to adapt to this new environment. I share Mr Sajanti's view that the higher interest rates we are experiencing may not be a passing phenomenon. Average interest rates over the next five years or more will likely be higher than what the world had experienced for the last 15 to 20 years. We need to prepare ourselves for this change. Sir, whether we are facing low interest rates or high interest rates, the government will continue to ensure that essential areas such as public housing, health care and education will remain affordable and accessible to all Singaporeans. For education, the government currently subsidises over 90% of the cost of education from primary to pre-university level. The subsidy rate for ITE is also more than 90%. For polytechnics and autonomous universities, government subsidies amount to around 85% and 75% of total costs, respectively. In addition, students can apply for bursaries and education loans to support their education-related expenses. The tuition fee loan scheme is available to all, while the study loan scheme is available to students from lower to middle income households. Both loan schemes do not incur interest during study and require repayment only after graduation. These are important support measures to ensure tertiary education remains affordable and no Singaporean child will be denied of the opportunity to receive a good education because of financial difficulties. On public housing, the government will continue to sell new flats at prices below market value with significant housing subsidies. The end in mind is to encourage home ownership and to enable as many, as many families as possible to own their homes. Minister Desmond Lee spoke about this earlier today. On the whole, the household debt situation in Singapore remains healthy. This is because of our prudent policies on unsecured consumer lending and residential mortgages. Residential mortgages are subject to loan-to-value limits as well as debt servicing ratios, which cap the amount of debt and monthly mortgage payment individuals can take on when they purchase properties. MES, MND and HDB recently announced measures to increase the medium-term interest rate floor used to compute the total debt servicing ratio and mortgage servicing ratio for property loans by financial institutions and introduce an interest rate floor for computing eligible loan amounts for housing loans granted by HDB. These will help ensure that property buyers continue to borrow prudently. We will continue to monitor the property market and review our policies where necessary in a rising interest rate environment. We will also work with financial and non-financial institutions to better help borrowers understand their loan commitments. Mr Satyandi highlighted the requirements MES places on financial institutions to explain how a borrower's monthly mortgage instalments would vary if interest rates increase. Non-financial institutions, such as licensed moneylenders, are required to explain to the borrower the terms of the loan contract and the breakdown of each repayment that goes into servicing the principal amount and other costs, all in a language that a borrower understands. In addition, licensed moneylenders are only permitted to impose fixed borrowing costs and fix interest rates, ensuring that borrowers would not be caught off guard by rising interest rates. Sir, for businesses, MES assesses that most businesses in Singapore are currently able to manage debt-related risks with sufficient liquidity holdings alongside the post-COVID earnings recovery. 
The government provides assistance to businesses through various credit schemes. Our economic agencies have assessed that there are available credit facilities for businesses. SME loan volumes, for example, have continued to be stable in recent months. With the expiry of the temporary bridging loan program, enterprises can still tap on the enterprise financing scheme, which supports access to financing for a wide range of business activities. And our economic agencies will monitor the situation closely and review the need for further adjustments. Importantly, businesses will need to double down on efforts to improve productivity and upgrade the skills of their workers. This is the most effective way to improve our overall competitiveness and achieve a win-win outcome for both businesses and workers through economic growth. There are many schemes available, including the Productivity Solutions Grant, the Energy Efficiency Grant, Skills Future Subsidies, and the newly introduced $70 million NTUC Company Training Committee Grant to help improve firm and worker productivity and to build new enterprise and workforce capabilities. The government will also continue to provide workfare income supplement and other support measures to boost the earnings of our low-wage workers. Let me now turn to the government's financial position. In the near term, significant market uncertainties have resulted in the weaker investment environment. The investment entities such as GIC and Temasek are closely monitoring macroeconomic and geopolitical developments, including changes to the interest rate environment, and they will continue to maintain diverse portfolios to manage investment risk. The impact of short-term market volatility on the net investment returns contribution, or NIRC, is mitigated as our NIR framework is designed to provide stability in an uncertain investment environment. It does so by smoothening out relevant asset bases over the long term and calculating NIRC based on the expected long-term real re rate of return of the investment entities. As such, the NIRC serves as a steady stream of returns to fund our annual expenditure even in periods of market uncertainty. And we are able to benefit from this source of revenue today and also during the COVID-19 pandemic because previous generations of Singaporeans worked hard and built up our reserves. So we must likewise do the responsible thing by safeguarding our reserves and growing it further so that we leave behind a strategic asset and lay the foundations for a better future that will benefit our children and our grandchildren. So I've spoken about how the government will look after individuals, households and businesses. Another important area is how all of us can play a role in helping one another in a caring and inclusive society. A key enabler is the high degree of trust in our society. Trust has allowed us to weather many uncertainties together, including our fight against COVID-19, and it will be a critical success factor as we face new challenges going ahead, such as rising inflation and higher interest rates. Like other members of this House, I've come across many heartwarming examples of institutions, community organisations and also individual Singaporeans pitching in to help others who are facing difficulties. They generously provide extra assistance to complement what the government is giving. Uh, Mr Sakandi and I are both serving in Bichon Topayo GRC and we are grateful to our corporate and community partners who work with us to provide additional local level assistance to our residents especially the vulnerable and lower-income families. For example, my volunteers and I have been distributing monthly we care packs containing food items and daily necessities to our lower-income families. They are sponsored by our donors. And I have also raised additional amounts through our Community Welfare Fund to provide NTUC vouchers and ang baos to our vulnerable SMSG, residents you have about 50 seconds left. to give them additional help on top of the assistance from government. I know many grassroots advisors are doing the same, and including Mr. Satyandi, as we say at the Chinese Development Assistance Council, CDAC, when each of us contribute a little to help others, it makes our society more caring and warm. 
Mr. Speaker, these experiences give me much confidence that Singapore and Singaporeans have what it takes to weather the challenges ahead. We are able to face stormy seas with greater confidence and resilience than many other countries because of our mutual trust and, so and our social cohesion. And we hope that every crisis will further strengthen our social compact and bring us even closer together as one united people. Thank you. Just in time. The question is that Parliament do now adjourn. As many as of the opinion say aye. aye. Do the contrary say no? I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order, order.